Okay, so right now we are on the part where there was an attempt to take Hitler's life. This is on page um, 17, kind of in the middle. So what happened in on July 20th was a group of people who wanted to overthrow Hitler, you know, kill him, and then uh, replacing brought a bomb in. Now, they used a war hero by the name of Klaus Stauffenberg. You don't need to know his name. He lost a couple fingers and then blinded, as you'll see in the little video excerpt. And uh, Hitler was supposed to meet him or to meet several generals and talk about how the war is going. And he was supposed to meet in a concrete building. Now, had that happened, the blast would have been more contained and more focused. But instead, Hitler changes the meeting to a building that's just a plain old wooden building. So a lot of the blast is going to dissipate. Now, Stauffenberg, it was given a couple of bombs. He had to, like, break a little spot, and they'd get the acid dripping. And then that would eventually, the acid would ignite the fuse, and the two bombs inside of a briefcase would go off. But because of the difficulty with his hand missing a couple of fingers, he's only able to get one bomb in there. Now, I don't know if you've ever assassinated a dictator or not before, but there are some rules. If you want to guarantee that the dictator dies, you're going to have to make sure that you die with them. It's the only way to guarantee it. You don't want to do what Schaffenberg did. He goes in, he's standing there along this big, heavy, thick wooden table, right? He puts the bomb right there in his briefcase, Sets it down because he's talking to Hitler, right? Then he gets a phone call, as you'll see in the video, and he has to leave. But a man bumps into the briefcase, moves the briefcase to the side of a big table leg, right? And so when the bomb goes, it blows away from Hitler. And Hitler is wounded. Um, he loses some of his hearing. Quite a few people, as you'll see in the picture, were killed. But Hitler will escape. So... Hopefully, uh, and if you look here, these people were killed, right? Because here's where the bomb was, right? And it blew out this way. People over here, like Hitler, were okay. So let's see if the little clip works. All right, there's the debris from it. And there's Hitler afterwards. Since the Red Army first attacked nearly a month ago, our troops have already... Now this is Tom Cruise playing Stauffenberg. So he had it set up for a guy to call him so then he could act like he was having to leave. Now Stauffenberg didn't hang up the phone, he just leaves it there. There's the briefcase he set. Vital points along the German right. Army group will be swallowed by the enemy less than a fortnight and we run the risk of losing all the ground we have managed to gain in the last three years. Yes, General, this is Stauffenberg. Now that's one of the guys involved in the conspiracy, basically. Now here's the guy playing him. That's a pretty good job. And he learned anger management from Mr. D. Notice how it fell over on its side, too? Like I said, if you're going to kill a dictator like Hitler, you better stay there. Make sure. See, there's the briefcase. One thing is certain. The Red Army will continue an aggressive push west, even at the expense of... In order to rebuild... At this one. already southwest of Duneborg and closing on And he actually took the other bomb with him, he had him with it with him, and as he's driving off, he like throws that one out into the the, the grass. Well there's Hitler again. <laughs> Woo! He blew up real good. Now he's sure he's dead. So everybody starts moving, taking over things, arresting Nazis. And so the army, you know, 
which hates the Nazis, right. hates the SS, they're going to take secure. over and they right. arrest a bunch of these folks. But right. then right. Hitler, later that afternoon, is going to get up, give a speech, let everybody know he's well. The whole conspiracy falls apart. They start arresting these people like crazy. Now, Schaffenberg will be one of the few lucky ones, y'all, because, and I say lucky, somewhat in jest, but um, he will be arrested. He will be tried if he even has a trial. They don't give him much of a trial. And he's just taking out in a courtyard and shot. When I was in Berlin a few years ago, I went to the place where they shot him and that. But the other conspirators, Hitler has a massive trial for them. Um, they are humiliated in public. The judge screams at them and everything. And ultimately, when they were killed, they are hung up with piano wire up on hooks. Hitler has it filmed so that other people know this is what happens if you mess with Hitler. So what had been their hope? Their hope was by knocking out Hitler and replacing him with the army, they could get a kinder peace. They could get some kind of conditional into the war because they knew that Hitler was going to fight all the way to the end. And we know, we now have Hitler's will and his instructions. He wanted everything in Germany destroyed, y'all. He wanted every German to fight to the death. He wanted Germany left with nothing. And so they hoped to negotiate a deal where, you know, um, it wouldn't be as bad for Germany. But, you know, when, if, when I just imagine sometimes, did they really think, that they could get away with all the terrible atrocities that they had done, especially to Jewish people. I mean, I, I just can't imagine that anybody would have negotiated a conditional end to the war. But that was their hope. And, you know, it makes Germans feel better that at least some of them tried to get rid of them. Someday I'll get all those stupid sound effects removed. So the cheering is because Paris, Paris, France, was liberated. Um... Who was allowed to, uh, American troops liberated it. We were the first to come in. Here's an M8 armored car coming in. But we allowed the French to enter. The French had been humiliated by their loss in World War I. I mean, World War II so quickly, you know, a matter of weeks and they fell. This was about trying to restore French pride. And America, very, very generous, and this is something you could use on an AP test uh, if you're having to talk about, you know, diplomatic relations, America let them come in um, first and let them march. You see de Gaulle, the leader of the Free French, entering, and then American troops marching down the Champs-Élysées. So that was a very generous thing to do. Now, the Battle of the Bulge, nicknamed Hitler's Last Gamble, Hitler came up with this idea. He was new weapons, y'all. The Germans were very, very desperate. They'd invented like a fighter jet. They had rocket shawl. Uh, that could fly from, you know, uh, France and Belgium and hit England, supersonic rockets. In fact, the guy who designed that is going to come over here to the United States after the war and be in charge of our effort to go to the moon and eventually develop the rockets to get to the moon. But before, he was working for Hitler. So they have all these weapons, but they're going to need time. So what Hitler does is there is awful weather predicted for Christmas. Americans are just thinking this war is almost over. We have a lot of very green, that is, inexperienced troops all along the line. We can't have all of our planes. One thing that we had complete control of, y'all, was air. We had air superiority. And normally we could have seen these people getting ready, but because of the fog, because of the bad weather, we didn't know these Germans were massing together. Now, right here was one of their greatest weapons. This is a King Tiger, one of the greatest tanks ever made. Mr. D's personal favorite, by the way. He had a whole unit of these things, several hundred of these, y'all. And with a giant surprise, they launched this attack, okay? Um, this massive counterattack. And as you can see here, this was the original line right here, y'all, between the Germans and the Americans and Brits. Now, the British were over on one side, we were over on the other side, and he drove this massive bulge in the line. 
Now, it wasn't supposed to be just a bulge. They were hoping to go all the way, y'all, to the port of Antwerp. They hoped to split the British and Americans and really, really delay the war, the end of the war, by months. And Hitler hoped by this time maybe his secret weapons would be there. Or he was hoping, too, and this is something you could use in AP, that the British and Americans would all be blaming each other for this disaster. It would split us in two. Maybe we would have to make some separate deal. But when we went to war with the Germans, and you guys will see this when we, or, yeah, when we went to war, and of course the Soviets were fighting, we had agreed, y'all, that nobody would make a separate peace. In other words, we would all fight to the very end. Instead of like, well, hey, they offered us a good deal. We're out of this war. Good luck, the rest of y'all. Hitler was kind of maybe hoping he could do that. But the Allied coalition, y'all, between us, the British, and the Soviets helped. Now, I know I'm kind of blocking it here a little bit. This becomes known as the Battle of the Bulge. One of the things that hurts the Germans is they begin to run out of gas. But General Patton, who, of whom you've heard me talk quite a bit, Patton takes his third army. And he launches a counterattack. He literally turned his army around, y'all. Something that's never been done, like in 24 hours, he turns his whole army around and he launches an attack back and he cuts off the bulge. He also relieves the 101st Airborne, a bunch of paratroopers, y'all, who are at a place called Bastogne. B-A-S-T-O. G-N-E, B-A-S-T-O-G-N-E. Mr. D, uh, D sadly has not gone there before. Um, now, next. Mussolini, uh, as soon as we went into Italy, y'all, Mussolini's uh, government fell. The Italian fascist government fell, and the Italians surrendered. Um, later, he was rescued by Hitler, but it only gave him a little bit of uh, a breather. And ultimately, he was captured by Italian communists. He was with his mistress, Claudia Pagacci, and ultimately, they were machine gunned to death. And after they shot her and him, they hung him up on these light posts here, okay? And uh, there's just another picture of him hung up there. People did terrible things to the bodies, y'all. Women squatted over him, urinated on him. All kinds of awful stuff. Now, Hitler heard about this, okay? And um, he decided there is no way I'm going to be captured alive. I'm not going to let them get me alive. I'm not going to let them get my body. I don't want to end up like my old hero, my old mentor, the inventor of fascism, Mussolini. Now, as you guys know, and this is also something you could use if you're talking about our relations with the British and the French, or the British and the Soviets during the war. But remember, the Soviets were advancing from the east towards the west, okay, after they'd won the Battle of Stalingrad and started advancing. And we and the British, we're marching from the west to the east. Ultimately, there would be a place that we would meet, and that place turned out to be on the Elba River. Now, this picture here, and I actually saw them interview these guys back in the uh, late 80s or early 90s, and they were still alive back then. But you see this picture. This is a Russian, right? And here's an American, and they're hugging each other. And everything looks hunky-dory, like they're really, really happy. And in this picture that I'm partially covering, you see Americans with their arms around Russians, and they're walking around like they're best buds. But the thing to remember is we were only allies because we were fighting the Germans. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. What's going to happen when the Germans surrender, y'all? Our alliance is going to fall apart, and we're going to get a Cold War. Briefly, y'all, the Soviets are going to promise that they will help us in the war against Japan. And that could have maybe kept us together longer. But when we drop the atomic bomb and Japan surrenders early, we don't have that chance to work together with them in Japan. But they do use it, the Soviets do, to grab a bunch of islands and stuff what they want. So it's kind of misleading because we were only allies of convenience. This was not going to last very long. My uncle, one of my uncles was uh, with some of the Russians. He ran into them and met. He, It was interesting. He, he said that, for one thing, he was kind of shocked because they had women in their military, right? Women 
not just you know working behind the scenes, actually fighting y'all um, in the military. But he also noticed that um, one of the guys said, you, you, you Americans, you have everything. Look at you eating cake, having cake all the time. He's like, cake, what are you talking about? It was white bread. They had never seen white bread before. They thought that was cake. Um, he also uh, said, though, he was very scared of them. I mean, how prepared they were, how tough they were, and that kind of thing. Now, the Russians, y'all, I should add this here, they did terrible things. Now, terrible things had been done to them when the Germans came in. The Germans, y'all, did not treat Russians like they treated Americans or British uh, prisoners of war, who they generally took decent care of. They saw the Russians, y'all, as, as these under men. They're not even full men. And they would just put barbed wire around them. They wouldn't feed them. They'd make them stand there until enough of them died that maybe somebody could lay down. If you were a German, I mean, if you were Russian and got captured by the Germans, you had very little chance to live. So there was a lot of hatred. And as the Russians came in and retook Germany or took Germany, they raped, they killed, they stole everything. Bunches of them, y'all, took toilets the toilet and they're like they thought the toilet would work without plumbing they didn't even have indoor plumbing y'all one poor german man i remember um father was forced to sit there and call out numbers for every time his daughter was raped by a different german i forget what the final number was but it was the way the woman remembered his young daughter how many times she'd been raped um so the the russians did terrible things but understand they were angry. I'm not saying it's right. Our men were much nicer. But in fact, y'all, Germans learned really quickly. Rather than surrender to the Russians, head west. And hopefully you can get to the Americans and the British who will treat you better. So the war that would replace World War II, y'all, would be the Cold War. And here you just see another color picture, actually, in this case of Russians and Americans hanging out together. We were allies, but this partnership would not last very long now that our common enemy had been defeated. Now, in April of 1945, just after we rendezvoused with the, uh, the Soviets, Franklin Delano Roosevelt died. Now, he would not live to see the victory that he had had such a big role in doing. He was down in Georgia uh, at a place he used to go that would help him. It was a spa with warm waters called Warm Springs, and he could relax in there. And he was having his painting done, and uh, he had, we think, kind of a stroke or aneurysm or something like that, and he died. He kind of complained of a headache, and he dropped dead. Sadly, and I hesitate to mention this, but he was not with his wife. He was with a mistress that he'd had for some time, which was, which is sad to say, but she had to kind of notify them, and then eventually he would be put on a train and taken back. Now, we've had no president, y'all, that lasted as long as he was. Had he lived longer, he would have been president for 16 years. As it was, as I've said before, you could have started kindergarten, and you would be a senior when this guy died. Now, this is a very poignant picture taken from Life magazine. Um, this man, this officer here, um, he had played for Roosevelt before, and this is at Roosevelt's funeral. As the as the hearse comes by, or the the um, he goes out, and with his accordion, he's playing. If you look in his eyes, he's crying. He played for the president before, and it really symbolizes y'all America's um, America's uh, love for Roosevelt. You know, he'd gotten them through the Great Depression. He'd gotten them through World War II. He had done a lot for African Americans, if you remember, uh, you know, that other presidents hadn't seemed to, to do. And many African Americans still to this day, y'all, are very loyal to the Democratic Party, going back to FDR and what he did for them during the Great Depression. So it says here, this is Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Graham Jackson. He's playing going home, right, on his accordion as FDR's casket passes by. And this, as it says, symbolizes not just our nation's grief, but African Americans' acknowledgement of what FDR had done on behalf of their civil rights. Now, finally, y'all, we uh, surround, or actually the Russians get to Berlin. We knew Berlin would be a bloodbath, y'all. 
many, many thousands of Americans would probably die. So the Americans made the decision to let the Russians take it. We might regret that later. Now the Germans, knowing that the Russians are coming, they are going to fight for every single inch of that place. Eventually, y'all, Hitler is going to take refuge in some bunkers underneath his chancellery. These, imagine, y'all, something about the size of our high school, all underground, with multiple rooms for people to stay, <coughs> all the modern conveniences. And that's what Hitler had built underground. So the Russians surround all parts of Berlin. Hitler takes refuge in this underground bunker down here. Now, his mistress, Hitler had never married. Um, it was kind of icky. He had a girlfriend for a long time that was his niece, and she'd committed suicide. Uh, yeah. But anyway, Ava Braun, who was the um, assistant to his photographer, his official photographer, and beautiful, I hate to admit, but she was beautiful, um, he had never married her. He'd always kind of kept her hidden. Well, Knowing that his life is about to end, he finally decides to ask her to marry him. So they get married down in the bunker. Now, Hitler gives a lot of the people who are in the bunker these little pills. They are cyanide pills that they can take. His propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, and his wife, Magda, before they take their own lives, they give those pills to their children. I think they had like five beautiful children. Um, and told them it would help them sleep with all the fighting and stuff going on. And so those kids y'all go to bed. And I think a couple of them kind of fought, and they maybe had to give them a shot because one of the girls was older. But they take the pills, they lay down, and of course they never wake up. Now Russians who had seen all kinds of horrible things in war, y'all, I heard some of them talk and they said, you know, the one thing that got to me was when I made my way down in that bunker, and here I came across these bunk beds with these beautiful children in them who had taken their lives. Now, um, Hitler's body, and uh, now what, how does Hitler die? Well, he wants to make sure the pill works, so allegedly he gave it to his dog, Blondie. Blondie, a German shepherd, because what else would Hitler have, died pretty quickly. So Ava and oh, Hitler, y'all, here, here's Ava, here's a picture of her. They go and they sit on this sofa here, and I got a picture of it on your, your map there, on your notes. And we think what happened was Hitler and she sat there. Uh, she took the cyanide pill. He may have also taken the cyanide pill and simultaneously shot himself, just to make sure. It's also possible, y'all, his butler or his chauffeur who found him, that he came in and he fired a shot. Now, here's down in the bunker. There's the little kids that are going to take their lives unknowingly. So Hitler's gone off in the room. Goebbels and them are waiting to see. Boom. Bullseye. Not, the kids don't know that that's just Hitler just shot himself. Now, because he didn't want anything happening to his body like it happened to Mussolini, y'all, his body is taken and her body is taken. And eventually, when the other guy takes his life, they, they take them out into a shell hole oh, and they pour it. gasoline on them and they set their bodies on fire. Now, eventually, Hitler's body was recovered what was left of it, it was burnt pretty badly along with Goebbels and his wife Magda and Ava Braun. And the Russians, y'all, put them in a big ammunition locker. And what they did was they moved them for a long time. Ultimately, they were buried underneath a driveway at a toxic waste place for years and years. And uh, finally in the 80s or early 90s, they took the bodies out. Papa. They took the bodies out and uh, they burned them and destroyed them and then they scattered the ashes in multiple rivers so that no neo-Nazis All right, we'll go ahead and stop right there. 
So Germany surrenders a few days later, and with that, y'all, we have Victory in Europe Day. So uh, we get Victory in Europe Day. Hitler um, is not around to continue fighting. A, another person named Donitz is going to take over, and he will surrender, and it's unconditional surrender. And to this day, it is known as VE Day. And the Russians, y'all, every year have a massive, massive parade. Uh, and then here's... I think like I said, VE or Victory in your update. All right, we'll stop right there. All right, so now we move on to the Pacific. This is all on page 18. Um, of course, it lasts from late December, uh, you know, when Pearl Harbor attack, or early December, December 7th to 1945 to August or September. The thing to remember, and people usually do this, is they talk about the theaters of war, the Pacific theater versus the European and North African theater separately. I don't want to be jumping back and forth. So the thing to remember, y'all, is, you know, so we're kind of going back. We ended the war in Europe. Now we're going back and we're going to be doing what was happening at the same time in the Pacific. Um, so just kind of remember these things are happening together. So just after Pearl Harbor, y'all, just after Pearl Harbor here, we got the Pacific Theater of Operations. And I don't know if you can see on my shirt today, but I, I wore a map for the, for the lesson today here. Um, but yeah, so I've got the whole theater of operations. And you can see how far the Japanese got, okay? They got all the way out to here. You think of it, just this little island, or four major islands, and all the area that they captured. Uh, and that was by August of 1942. And then it was kind of downhill from them. Um, now, after Pearl Harbor, okay, if we look on here, after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese captured the Philippine Islands. There was a long siege there, and ultimately, American troops surrendered. Now, the thing is, you got to understand that to the Japanese soldier in the Bushito Code, they believe that if you surrender, you no longer are really a human anymore. You've lost your dignity, and they can do whatever they want. So American soldiers and Filipino soldiers, y'all, were forced to march over 50 miles without much water or food um, in what became known as the Bataan Death March. And remember, they had already been under a siege for, for months, y'all. They were already hungry, starving, you know, lacking a lot of their basic vitamins and things like that. And, and now they're told, you got to march these 50 miles. I, I don't know if our uh, ROTC folks do this here anymore. But they used to have a event called the Bataan March where I don't know how far they went, but everybody in the group had to complete it. And if one of your members of your group, like, got tired or hurt themselves, you had to carry that person. And you can see that happening here in these pictures. These are wounded Americans. They had to be carried by others because if you stopped and you were unable to move anymore, a Japanese officer would come by or even a regular soldier and stab you with the bayonet. An officer was likely to use his sword. Now, to the credit of the Filipino people, y'all, a lot of them stood along the way and they would sneak water or try to sneak food to the Americans and the Filipino POWs, prisoners of war. I remember one um, one guy talking, because I remember some, we, or we had a neighbor that was actually a veteran um, of this march. And um, they talked about, you know, the, the Japanese officer, he had this idea that if he ever drew his sword, he couldn't put it back in the scabbard without drawing blood. So he pulled it out for some reason, and he looked around, and here's a Filipino man standing there with his baby, holding his baby. He just whew, sliced off the head of the baby. Um, and then trucks would come driving right down the road, and some of them, y'all, would just hold their swords out. So if you weren't paying attention, you might get de decapitated or lose an arm. Sometimes they would drive right into the group. Like I said, they had no respect. One guy I saw interviewed, they got him and they were questioning him. And I guess he didn't know what they wanted. So they held him, and the Japanese officer was smoking a cigarette. They held him, they took the cigarette, and they burned it right into his eyeball. He was still blind 40 years later, obviously, uh, for that. So just a lot of cruelty. And I say this not to make the Japanese today look bad because 
Like I said, I had a friend in Japan, he's passed away now, who was a soldier, and I can't imagine Goro doing any of this kind of thing. Um, he was a very, very good man. But they felt superior to other people, and they saw Americans who surrendered as basically scum. But understand this when Americans dropped an atomic bomb that most Americans did not shed any uh, tears for these people. I know civilians and children who were killed, they weren't responsible. But sadly in war, y'all, that's, that's what happens is a lot of good, innocent people die for the actions of their leaders. Uh, many of them were killed along the way. Like I said, the Japanese had contempt uh, for any soldiers who surrendered. And here you just see some more scenes. This one actually is from before, and you see them walking their way back. 76,000 of whom only 12,000 were American. So most of these were Filipinos. 60 miles they marched. I said 50, but it was 60. Blazing heat without any food to the POW camps, uh, Camp McDonald. One picture I saw as a kid, y'all. And I had it in a magazine, and I don't have the magazine anymore. And I've tried to find that picture on the web. But it was like the saddest thing. It was the skeleton of a human being, this American soldier. And he made it to the camp. And he made it to water. And he was bent over on the, um, the water faucet, getting ready to get a drink when his heart gave out. And he literally died trying to get a drink of water. He made it to the camp, but then just gave out. Just more scenes here. You see, look at the look of anger on this guy's face. And then here you can see the march from where they surrendered all the way up there. Now, I'll tell you another story. It is because these men were treated so badly, when the Japanese began to lose the Philippines and it looked like we were going to rescue these guys, the Japanese, y'all, took a bunch of them and they put them in an air raid shelter near the water. Okay? Then they poured and they pumped gasoline in from like the airplanes and they filled it up with gasoline they threw a match in it and they closed the doors and burned alive a lot of the survivors this is like three years later now of course there's always somebody who gets away this one man got away he dove into the water he managed to swim and reach the americans and that's when general macarthur who had returned to the philippines after you know, being away for a couple of years after being forced to leave, he organized a rescue. And there's a movie, um, I'm not sure what the movie is called, but the book, oh, the movie's called like The Greatest Raid, but the book was called Ghost Soldiers. And it's amazing. They got to the guys and they saved him because the Japanese, y'all, had instructions to kill him. And in fact, also, y'all, a lot of the Americans, as the Japanese were losing the Philippines, they put these Americans on boats. Once again, a lot of them without food and water. And I remember hearing this one guy talk, and he said they were, they were just hungry and thirsty, and they're down below. And he said one night they caught one of their own men biting and sucking the blood out of his fellow Americans, and they beat him to death because they were like, no, we're not going to go there. And he said... When American planes started attacking the ship, not knowing, of course, that it had American prisoners of war on it, they were hoping it would work. They were hoping that their ship would get sunk. Why? Because, of course, they would die. They were that miserable. And when they finally reached Japan, um, the instructions apparently were when the United States invaded Japan, the Japanese were to kill all the prisoners of war. We don't know if that would have happened, but, but that was the threat, that they would kill them all. Maybe they would have held some of them for ransom or whatever. So um, those are some of the guys that were saved by the dropping of the atomic bomb as well. Here's some of the POWs when they got liberated, y'all, how skinny they were. They basically had to provide their own food, own medicine and stuff. The Japanese gave them almost nothing to live with. Now, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a movie called Unbroken. I should have shown you a clip from it. The movie's directed by Angelina Jolie, very talented lady, but what was unfortunate about the movie was it really just kind of focused on the torture and abuse this guy went. Uh, Lou Zaffarini had been an athlete and had won or had done really well in the Olympics. He was one of the fastest humans alive. 
And so when he got captured and the Japanese found out he was a great athlete from the Olympics, they, they extra tortured him and made him do all kinds of things, but he would never, ever give in, and that's why it's called Unbroken. I mean, he was on a raft for days. And, oh, I mean, the story, y'all, it's Unbroken is one of the most amazing books ever. They made it to a movie, and sadly, Angelina Jolie concentrated more on the positive, I mean, the, uh, the torture and stuff. What she didn't talk about is how this man who ended the war just angry at the world, particularly ang angry at the Japanese, he was in um, California. He had a drinking problem by now. He was, you know, abusing himself or trying to heal himself by taking, you know, lots of alcohol. And he went to see Billy Graham, the minister, and he was saved. He was saved, and he became a missionary, and he later went to Japan. He actually ran in the Olympics there, carrying the torch past where his old prisoner site was, and he went to go meet the man who had tortured him and to forgive him, okay? That wasn't in the movie. And to me, that was the most amazing part. They later made a sequel, um, and maybe it's in that. I haven't seen that. But once again, Unbroken, you ever get a chance to see it? It's a tough watch, but it's an amazing book. I don't recommend books all very often, but it's a book that I've bought copies and given them to friends over the years because it's so good. Yeah. That movie that you saw Hitler uh, killing himself. Oh, the, the bombing one. The bombing one was called Valkyrie. V-A-L-K-Y-R-I-E. Valkyrie. The one where you saw them watching and he went into the room and killed himself. That's called Downfall. Downfall. Hopefully that will make it through the copyrights when I post all this stuff. So there you see, like I said, how far the Japanese had gotten. Now, um, I'm going to mention this a little bit. Um, now, American morale was awful after Pearl Harbor. You can imagine. And Americans wanted to strike back. And so Colonel Doolittle, who actually had trained out here at Ellington Field, y'all, uh, back in the day, he leads a raid. Now, he was an amazing guy. He had a Ph.D., uh, from MIT, y'all. Um, he'd been a great air racer and stuff, and he comes up with this idea to take bombers, big bombers with two engines, y'all, and fly them off an aircraft carrier to get close enough to Japan that they can bomb Japan from it. This will make Americans feel better. Now, you know you're not going to win the war with a handful of airplanes, 16 airplanes, but um, it's going to make Americans feel a lot better. Now, here is Doolittle, and here's the captain of his ship. And I was fortunate enough, y'all, uh, to get to spend an afternoon uh, with his co-pilot, a man by, by the name of Cole, Richard Cole. And I still have a recording, an audio recording of him, and he flew next to him. But the planes take off. They were put on board. You can see how big these are. And, of course, they took up a lot of the deck of the aircraft carrier. Now, he and Dick Cole were on the very front, uh, so they had the least room to go. And here you see Doolittle's plane taking off. Now, the Japanese, they got as close as they could, and then some Japanese ships spotted them. So they had to launch early. They took off a lot of their weapons. They carried extra gas cans that they would fill up on the way. But because of this, they knew a lot of them would never make it back to China because they were supposed to bomb, China, uh, bomb Japan and then fly to China. And then the Chinese, who are our allies, would have those planes. And so they hit Japan. Uh, they bomb, you know, several uh, factories and military sites. They make sure they hit several cities. And what it does, y'all, is it's a great morale boost for Americans, but it also, y'all, gets the Japanese to bring a lot of troops back, okay, and a lot of uh, weapons and stuff to protect their home islands. Now, several of the Americans got captured by the Japanese, and they were tortured and they were ultimately beheaded. Uh, one plane had to land in Russia, which was an ally of ours, but wasn't fighting the Japanese. The Russians hold them for a while, they escaped, and then they made their way back to the United States. Now, Midway, y'all, is considered the turning point of the war and the Pacific. What happens is, um, see, it's a turning point. Did you see that turn there? Yeah, let's turn again some more. Midway, the turning point. Now, 
Americans had used code breaking of the Japanese military code, and uh, they were able to figure out where the Japanese were heading. Now, the Japanese were launching like a feint, a fake attack up towards the Aleutian Islands off to Alaska. But what they were really planning on doing was seizing this island midway, which you can see on your picture, uh, on, your, on your notes, was midway out there in the Pacific. So it was like sort of a trick that they were doing. Well, we only had two carriers. One had been really damaged in a battle called the Battle of Coral Sea earlier. But we had two, well, we had the Enterprise was also there, so take it back, we had three. But our, we're able, y'all, to surprise the Japanese and bless their hearts. I say that in a weird way, I know, because of some of the stuff I said, but they were changing their, their planes from carrying bombs to carrying torpedoes, and they were refueling them, and we caught them on deck, y'all. And four Japanese carriers were sunk for the loss of only one American carrier. And here we see an SB Dauntless diving right down onto those Japanese carriers. So many Americans felt like this had revenge, had gotten us revenge for Pearl Harbor, okay? Now, and here's just some of the planes. In this first group of Devastators plane, y'all, every single plane was lost. One guy survived, and he was uh, in a life preserver until he was eventually recovered after the battle, but he got to watch the whole thing. Here we see an Avenger aircraft. It's the same kind of plane that the first President Bush flew in the war. Now, we look at this political cartoon here, Midway, Tide Stick. In other words, the tide is turning, right? Uh, this is the turning point of the war. Well, well, seems to be a slight shifting of the Japanese current, it says. Now, if you can recognize, look at the little figures here, okay, how they're drawn. Guess who did it? Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss was enlisted and was a political cartoonist in the war. The real guy's name is Ted Geisel, but he, he did uh, cartoons during the war. Now, America's strategy would be known as island hopping. And the way it would work is, rather than try to capture every single island that the Japanese had taken, General MacArthur's story was to hop over some of them, maybe the ones not so important, and take the major ones. And then we would use our submarines and our ship shawl to keep food and resources from getting to the people on the other islands, and we would starve them out. Um, I remember I was telling you about my friend Goro Suzuki. We were um, looking at a ship in, in Yokohama. We were both big ship buffs, and I was asking him about various Japanese ships. And every time I would name a ship, he would say, sunk by U.S. Navy. I'm like, well, what about the so-and-so? Sunk by U.S. Navy. And eventually it came to, there was just like a couple left. Um, and one of them was right there where we saw. We pretty much sunk everything that they had. Um, and so we were able to take those islands, y'all. Now, I was hoping to have some videos here, um, but they, they weren't on the computer. So uh, the war in the Pacific here. So you'll see a picture coming up here. The most famous island captured is, of course, going to be Let's go! Yokohama. The most famous one taken is going to be. I'm going to turn the. They would just keep on attacking you. John Bassaloni, who won a medal for the Now, this is actually a lot of the that we fought to take back.
JP, cover me!